Hello, my name's Julian Grenier, and I'm really delighted to be opening this short 20 minute video, which is all about the progress check at age two in the EYFS. And I've been working on this video with my colleague, Megan Pacey. So what will we be covering in this video? First of all, we're going to be thinking about what is the progress check at age two with the changes to the EYFS, how and why has the guidance been revised? How can we make sure that we reduce any unnecessary paperwork that's associated with the progress check at age two? Lots of us who are working with two-year-olds have been worried about how they're doing because of COVID-19. How can we use the check to help children bounce back from the pandemic? We're going to be thinking about integrated reviews where practitioners work closely with NHS professionals. We're going to be talking with some of those practitioners who do this work. Uh, we're going to have a particular focus on special educational needs and disabilities. And finally, we're going to hear some concluding words from Professor Iram Siraj. Hello, I'm Megan Pacey, and I'm an associate of Sheringham Nursery School and Children's Centre. I'm going to introduce what the progress check at age two is all about. The progress check at age two is a statutory assessment of children's development carried out when children are aged between two and three. Early as practitioners review a child's level of development and provide parents and or carers with a short written summary focusing in particular on the three prime areas set out in the UFS framework. Those are communication and language, personal, social and emotional development, and physical development. The progress check at two identifies a child's strengths and any areas where progress is less than typically expected. It can help practitioners to develop a targeted plan to support the child. This is especially important if there are emerging issues or concerns um, or an identified special educational need or disability. The check can be supported by using non-statutory guidance documents, including the Development Matters document and the What to Expect in the Early Years Foundation Stage Guide for Parents. So let's talk a little bit about the revised guidance for the progress check at the age of two. The reforms to the EYFS became statutory on the 1st of September 2021 and impact all early years providers in England. The key aims of the reforms were to improve the child outcomes at age five, particularly in early language and literacy, and reduce unnecessary paperwork so that teachers and practitioners can spend more time supporting children through rich curriculum activities. Given the changes to assessment practice that the EYFS reforms encourage, the existing guidance for the progress check at age two also required updating so that, so that it continues to be in line with government policy. The revised non-statutory guidance set out three main purposes of the progress check at age two. Firstly, a partnership with parents. Practitioners and other professionals and parents and carers can support children's development and well-being so much better by working closely together. Secondly, an action for every child. Practitioners need to listen and to talk with the child, each other, and the child's parents and carers, and then plan together. And thirdly, early identification. Sensitive early intervention can make a big difference. Children develop rapidly between the ages of two and three, and practitioners need to be quick to support and identify help where it is needed. Acting in the best interests of children has always been key to effective early years practice. Inequality can damage children's learning, development and well-being from a very early age. High quality early education and childcare can play a part in tackling this problem. Each family is unique. It's important not to make negative assumptions about disadvantaged children. Instead of making assumptions, we need to know, value and understand the children we are working with. Many families in disadvantaged circumstances do a great job supporting their children's learning and development. However, by the time they are five years old, disadvantaged children are already behind their learning and development. The gap is particularly wide in language. Early years play a crucial role in making life changes more equal for everyone. Every child can make progress with the right support. 
the two-year-old progress check as a key statutory tool to ensuring that that happens. An important theme in the revised EYFS is reducing unnecessary paperwork. I think it's useful just to recap the statutory requirements set out in the EYFS of the progress check at age two. These are the things we must do as practitioners. We must provide parents with a short written summary of their child's development in the prime areas of learning. That's communication and language, personal, social and emotional development and physical development. We must discuss with parents how that summary can support their child's learning and development at home. If we've got any concerns about the child's development, learning or well-being, we need to set out the actions we're going to take in our setting to address that. Beyond these points, it's for us to decide what the written summary document could include. The guidance from the DfE will help us to make an accurate assessment of children's development, health and well-being. It will help us in our close work with parents and other professionals. And it will help us to take appropriate actions that are in the best interests of the child once the check is complete. Because if we just fill in the check and hand it to the parent or save it in a filing cabinet, put it on our hard drive, that's not going to make any positive difference for the wonderful two-year-olds that we're working with. The guidance is there to inform, support and offer suggestions. It's not there to replace our professional judgment. It can help us to reduce unnecessary workload. We don't need to spend long periods of time away from the children, nor do we need to collect lots of examples or lots of tracking data to complete the check well. Um, I'm really delighted to be joined by Wendy Ratcliffe, HMI, who's Principal Officer for Early Education Policy at Ofsted. And Wendy, we know that Ofsted have been collecting lots of really significant evidence about two-year-olds in early years education. Do you want to just tell us some of what you've been finding? Yeah, absolutely. So we have been using our um, insights from inspection over the last couple of terms to report on um, education recovery in um, mm -hmm. early years provision. And it's interesting, really, because, you know, some of those things that we've been looking to do is we want to we want to find out what the continuing effect of the pandemic um, is having on children's learning and development um, and potentially what strategies um, for the recovery of children's learning and development that, that providers are using. So we've been using our insights from our inspection to, to have a look at that. And what I think what's really important when we think about our two year olds is that the two our two year olds are now having their second birthday and they've known nothing other than a life in pandemic, mm -hmm. you know, a, a life of adults wearing face coverings and missing those opportunities for socialization. And some of the things that we're finding um, in those um, recovery briefings that we've published, particularly for children under two, is that they're arriving in their early year settings with weaker communication and language skills. Some are struggling to separate from their parents and, um, you know, and struggling with those social skills and that this cohort of children, that they've struggled more than others because of being able to settle with unfamiliar adults and they're a bit more wary, shyer, quieter and some have just felt overwhelmed in those large groups um, and providers have been telling us that they attribute that to those limited social interactions that children have had over the last couple of years. Um, and I think also important is, um, you know, some of those delays as well that we're seeing in, in some of the physical skills. Mm. I think, so, sorry. yes, please go on. I was going to say, I think one of the things that's really important when we think about, you know, not some children coming into their early years setting and having not heard as many words as others and how the pandemic potentially is attributed to some of some of that, those weaker communication and language skills. What I think is really important that we remember is that that doesn't mean that these children have a specific, you know, uh, special educational need, for example. 
what's important is for providers to identify what it is that those children know and can do already, what potentially they have missed out on. And actually, just because they haven't learned something yet doesn't mean that they've got a special educational need, for example. It's just that they've missed out on those opportunity. And that's what's important for early years providers to be able to provide those opportunities in order for children to, to keep up, catch up with, with what they've missed. Okay, I'm really delighted to be joined by Althea Dove, who's a speech and language therapist um, working in Newham. And one of the things which we know is really important um, in the early years is that integrated working between early years professionals and other professionals from the NHS. And Althea, I wonder if you would just like to talk us through why you think that integrated working with NHS professionals is so important for us in the early years. Yeah, so I work really closely um, with the education setting and I'm, um, I work in lots of different schools across Newham, um, including um, Sharing and Children's Centre. Um, and it's so, so vital that we work closely with the early years practitioners because we need to be able to be providing them with strategies to support the children on a day to day basis in school when we're not always able to be there. So that kind of ongoing continuity of care is really important. Um Having that whole picture of the child is really important, isn't it? And building on each other's um, expertise. And we were talking earlier about um, those children who look like they might have a speech and language difficulty or delay when they're aged between two and three. Do you want to just talk us through how things can go for children when we work well together and provide them with that holistic support? Yeah, so it may be that the school um, ask me to do an initial assessment with the child um, if there are concerns around their speech, language and communication development. Um, and so following my assessment, I may give recommendations to parents to support the child at home, but also I'll give them uh, the recommendations to the school staff to be able to be implementing um, on a daily basis. And I can then kind of um, come and support the children and monitor that progress and um, give, give staff tips to um, to continue that support because um, there are so many children that um, have identified speech and language difficulties um, and you know 70 percent of children um, with a possible delay in communication language will catch up with the right support and setting in, uh, and at home so it's really important that we provide that early intervention and um, but there are those children that will have that longer term language delay or disorder um, and will need to continue support from me so it's really important that we kind of support all children at that early stage um, yeah it's just vital for their development right, okay so with regards to the two-year check um, it's an important piece of work that you do um, so how do you how do you ensure your your parents realize the importance of it and the importance of their input into the check so kind of how do you make sure that the relationship you have is, is a two-way relationship and they're respected in their thoughts and their views and obviously the children's views as well. So on a daily basis we will always have um, like a rundown of what their child has done, what they've enjoyed, um, if they've had any kind of difficulties or anything. So when it does get to the conversation of two-year progress check it won't be something that comes as a surprise, it will be something that we've been working um, on during the time and where it's such a a regular conversation um, that we've sort of spoken together about. They'll tell me how they've got on at home. I'll share things that, that we've done at our setting. We'll speak together about what's worked well and how we can progress and what their child genuinely enjoys. So I'm delighted to be joined now by Lindsay Foster, who's an experienced early as Senko, and Amy Liu, who's an experienced reception teacher and uh, also works as a Senko. Um, and Lindsay, to start off with, it would be really interesting to hear some of your insights um, into the progress check at age two when you're thinking about children with SEND. Talk us through some of the key points. 
Oh, thanks, Julian. So first of all, I think it's really important that if a key person has a concern about a child, um, that they may think they have some additional needs, that they involve the SENCO or the area SENCO and have those discussions to talk through what their concerns are. So it's really important that key people don't just assume or have or label children and say that a child has SEND, particularly with parents. Um, it's important that parents are really involved in those discussions with the key person and they mm -hmm. really celebrate what the child can do and that whole child and start from where what they can do, talk about what the barriers are and have that really uh, back and forth conversation about what they can put in place together to help the child overcome any barriers. Um, during that discussion, they would they may also talk about um, referring to an external agency, you know, if they have had the Senko involved. So that could be a referral to speech language and communication, or it may just be working with the Senko in the school uh, to be involved in that plan in the earlier days. It's also really important to work with health at that point too. So, you know, working with the health visitor who may know that child and have been involved in that child um, life from an earlier age as well. Great, so that we've got that team of people kind of yeah. coming together. Amy, we're really pleased you've been able to join us because I know it's a very busy day um, in the primary school today. Um, you've taught reception for many years and you're now a SENCO. Just talk to us a bit about why you think it's so important for reception teachers and primary school SENCOs to know about the progress check at age two. Absolutely, it's, it's, it's a massive um, part of the picture um, and it's so important for um, early years leads, reception teachers, SENCOs to be able to build a history of the child. Um, it contains really, really vital information um, that, that helps us to um, work out what the child's strengths are, what their difficulties have been in the past, um, and give us um, a real kind of uh, insight and um, wealth of knowledge on what has happened before, what has worked, what hasn't worked, who the child's been referred to, um, and, and really helps us to think about um, what we can do next and how we can continue to support the child. Thank you, Lindsay. And thank you, Amy. I hope it's come across clearly that the focus of the progress check at age two needs to be on taking action where a child may have special educational needs. And this diagram from the guidance document gives a really helpful summary of how we should think about this in the assess, plan, do, review cycle. It's all about doing things for children. It's not about just collecting lots of information or tracking data about what level children are at. It's about getting everyone together to support the child, to overcome any barriers they may be experiencing, to play and learning in the setting so they can thrive in their early years. Particularly, we may have concerns about some of our children's communication. We can use the checkpoints in development matters as a focus for the discussion about that with parents. They are checkpoints and not intended as a checklist to be run through, a focus for that discussion. That discussion with parents is so important because we know that the home learning environment is so important in the development of children's early speech, language and communication and that what parents do really makes a difference. And you can search online for Hungry Little Minds for lots of great ideas to support parents to chat, play and read with their children. If you're worried about a child's communication, you may want to use ICANN's inquiry service. You can search online, it's free. You get a 30 minute call. Parents and practitioners can use this service to discuss any queries or concerns they have about a child uh, with a speech and language therapist. The service does not include meeting or assessing the child themselves. So I'm delighted now to move on to the final section of this video, where we're going to take a bit of a broader final look at the 
critical importance of this phase of the early years when children are aged between two and three years old. And we're going to be hearing from one of the world's leading researchers on early childhood education and care, Professor Iram Siraj. So really delighted to get the opportunity now to speak to Professor Iram Siraj. And Iram, there is a wealth of research and evidence about the importance of early childhood education and care. And you've been working in this field for decades now as one of the world's leading researchers. So we know lots about the key importance of early years and in particular, the two to three year old phase, which we're thinking about with the EYFS progress check, age two. I wonder if you could just talk us through some of the highlights, some of the stuff we really need to know about uh, when we think about this. Oh, thank you, Julian. Um, we know from the work of uh, the global economist, James Heckman, that the first five years are important. I don't think anybody needs convincing of that anymore. But the Heckman equation is more complicated. It separates out the first three years as the most critical. And we also know from neuroscience that it's a rapid time for brain development and therefore the foundations for cognitive and social emotional and physical learning, and that these are all connected. Closer to home, we have the two Michael Marmot reviews on the importance of early development on health, education, and well being. So, this evidence is further supported by the huge short start evaluation we had undertaken, the EPSI study, Effective Preschool, Primary, and Secondary Education study, and the Millennium Cohort study. And the Education Endowment Foundation, uh, the EEF, has further emphasized this early period for addressing strong foundational learning. And the pandemic and inequality in our society has exacerbated the early attainment gap. So it's also important that the two-year-old check that you've been working on is really well understood and used not as uh, a simple a tick sheet to hmm. check things off, but used as a way of formatively assessing children and responding to where they are to help their development. So there needs to be some opportunity in settings to uh, use the non-statutory guidance to reflect on each child's assessment and discuss with others what the child needs and how to support them in their learning. And by that, I mean physical, emotional and cognitive. And this is what's going to support their well-being, especially if it's sensitively supported with parents and other staff and appropriate activities are extended to the home learning environment as well. We know this is a highly this is highly skilled work and our workforce needs all the support and help that they can get. And I think that this non-statutory guidance for under threes will go a long way to providing that. 